So what we're working on today is Philip Opperman's blog, um, writing an OS in Rust. We've done in previous episodes, right? We've done a freestanding Rust binary, minimal Rust kernel, VGA text mode testing. The link to this is in the description, uh, the, the channel description. Um, we did exceptions, double faults, and hardware interrupts. We did intro to paging, and then we did this very long paging implementation. Um, and I'm not sure how long these guys are, heap allocation and allocator designs, but we're going to be working on allocator designs today. Uh, sorry, heap allocation today. We have, we have to do that first. Okay, let me just do a quick reset here, and I think I'm ready to go. Yeah, heap allocation. Uh, this post adds support for heap allocation to our kernel. First, it gives us an introduction to dynamic memory and shows us how the borrow checker prevents common allocation errors. It then implements basic allocation interface in Rust, it creates heap memory region, and sets up an allocator crate. At the end of this post, all the allocation and collection types of the built-in alloc crate will be available to our kernel. Okay, that's good. So we will be able to allocate things um, like using box maybe in RC and stuff like that. Uh, local and static variables. We currently use two types of variables in our kernel, local variables and static variables. Local variables are stored on the call stack and are only valid until the surrounding function returns, right? Static variables are stored at a fixed memory location and always live for the complete lifetime of the program. Right, and then there's heap allocated, right? So we're currently only using these two types, but we'll, we will, with allocation, we'll be able to, do, to use heap allocated types as well. So local variables are stored on the call stack, which is a stack data structure that supports push and pop operations. On each function entry, the parameters, the return address, and the local variables of the called function are pushed by the compiler. The above example shows the call stack after an outer function called an inner function. We see that the call stack contains the local variables of outer first. On an inner call, the parameter one and the return address for the function were pushed. Then the control was transferred to inner, which pushed its local variables. After the inner function returns, its part of the call stack is popped again and only the local variables of outer remain. We see that the local variables of inner only live until the function returns. The Rust compiler enforces these lifetimes and throws an error when we use a value too long. For example, when we try to return a reference to a local variable. Right, this is saying return a static type, U32, and this is returning a reference to something that's, uh, that was allocated on the stack here. Run the example on the playground on the playground. So this should give us the um, uh, returning something with a uh, lifetime that doesn't live long enough or something. Um, how do we, oh, we can run it this way, right? Returns a reference to data owned by the current function. Uh, it doesn't say it, f it gets freed by the current function, but that's essentially it. Uh, and Rust compiles it even though it's never used. I guess when we check usage, because it main doesn't call it, right? Um, so this function is actually, would not be part of the result, or it wouldn't be part of the binary because it's never called, but uh, we still compile it. Okay. While returning a reference makes no sense in this example, there are cases where we want a variable to live longer than the function. We already saw such a case in our kernel when we tried to load and interrupt descriptor table and had to use a static variable to extend the lifetime. Static variables. Static variables are stored at a fixed memory location separate from the stack. This memory location is assigned at compile time by the linker and encoded in the executable. Statics live for the complete runtime of the program. So they have a static lifetime and can always be referenced from local variables. So when a compiler compiles and a linker links and a loader loads, there's actually different segments of a executable that say whether it's a text segment, which means code, 
um, I don't know why it's called text because it's just it's compiled code. Um, and then there's also the data segment, which contains this pre-initialized data, in this case here. And then there's the BSS segment, which is also data, but it's uninitialized. Um, when the inner function returns in the above example, it's part of the call, its part of the call stack is destroyed. The static variables live in a separate memory range that is never destroyed, so the ampersand Z1 reference is still valid after the return. Right. Apart from the static lifetime, static variables also have the useful property that their location is known at compile time, so that no reference is needed for accessing it. We utilize that property for our println macro. By using a static writer internally, there is no mute write or reference needed to invoke the macro, which is very useful in exception handlers where we don't have access to any additional variables. However, this property of static variables brings a crucial drawback. They are read-only by default. Rust enforces this because a data race would, incur, would occur if, e.g., two threads modify a static variable at the same time. The only way to modify a static variable is to encapsulate it in a mutex type, which ensures that only a single mute reference exists at any point in time. We already used a mutex for our static VGA buffer writer. All right, dynamic memory. Local and static variables are already very powerful together and enable most use cases. However, we saw that they both have their limitations. Local variables only live until the end of the surrounding function or block. This is because they live on the call stack and are destroyed after the surrounding function returns. Static variables always live for the complete runtime of the program, so there's no way to reclaim and reuse their memory when they're no longer needed. Also, they have unclear ownership semantics and are accessible from all functions, so they need to be protected by a mutex when we want to modify them. Another limitation of local and static variables is that they have fixed size, so they can't store a collection that dynamically grows when more elements are added. There are proposals for unsized R values in Rust that would allow dynamically sized local variables, but they only work in some specific cases. To circumvent these drawbacks, programming languages often support a third memory region for storing variables called the heap. The heap supports dynamic memory allocation at runtime through two functions called allocate and deallocate. It works in the following way. The allocate function returns a free chunk of memory of the specified size that can be used to store a variable. This variable then lives until it's freed by calling the deallocate function with a reference to the variable. Let's go through an example. So here, z is alloc being allocated on the heap, and then it's returned. Oh, we write to it, and then we return the offset of one of them. I don't know how this deallocate is going to work, because it's referencing something in the middle. Right? y is equal to offset of i. Yeah, I don't know how that's going to work. I don't, I don't follow this example. Let's, let's read the text and see if it makes more sense. Here, the inner function uses heap memory instead of static variables for storing z. It first allocates a memory block of the required size, which returns a star mute 32 raw pointer. It then uses pointer write method to write the array 1, 2, 3 to it. In the last step, it uses the offset function to calculate a pointer to the ith element and then returns it. Note that we omitted some required casts and unsafe blocks in this example function for brevity. Okay. The allocated memory lives until it's explicitly th freed through a call to deallocate. Thus, the return pointer is still valid even after inner is returned and its part of the call stack was destroyed. The advantage of using heap memory compared to static memory is that there, the memory can be reused after it's freed, which we do through the deallocate call in outer. After that call, the situation looks like this. Oh yeah, so they're deallocate. Hmm, hmm. I don't. Does that really work? Because we're allocating a a size of u thirty two three, so it's allocating a very specific size of memory. It writes to that memory and then it returns a reference to x is one, so it's returning re re a reference to this middle element here. Then we're deallocating chunk in the middle. I don't know if that works. That 
Mm. Okay. We see that the Z of one slot is free again and can be reused for the next allocate call. However, we also see that Z of zero and Z of two are never freed because we never deallocate them. Such a bug is called a memory leak and often the cause of excessive memory consumption of programs. Just imagine what happens when we call inner repeatedly in a loop. I don't know that this would work. It definitely would not work in C. Because when you allocate memory in C, there's all the beginning of the allocated region or just before the returned pointer is the size information or some data information about the stuff you allocated. At least I'm pretty sure. So if you tried to allocate something or free something here, it would write assuming this was not allocated. Mm, I don't know that this would work. Okay. Common errors. Apart from memory leaks, which are, un, are which are unfortunate but don't make the program vulnerable to attackers, there are two common types of bugs with more severe consequences. When we accidentally continue to use a variable after calling deallocate on it, we have a so-called use after free vul vulnerability. Such a bug causes undefined behavior and can often be exploited by attackers to execute arbitrary code. When we accidentally free a variable twice, we have a double free vulnerability. Vulnerability. That's hard for me to say. This is problematic because it might free a different allocation that was allocated in the same spot after the first deallocate call. Thus, it can lead to a use after free vulnerability again. These types of vulnerabilities are commonly known, so one might expect that people learned how to avoid them by now. But no, such vulnerabilities are still regularly found. For example, this recent use after free vulnerability in Linux that allowed arbitrary code execution. Twenty nineteen. So yes, fairly recent. This is being recorded in twenty twenty two. Okay. This showed that even the best programmers are not always able to correctly handle dynamic memory and complex projects. To avoid these issues, many languages such as Java or Python manage dynamic memory automatically using a technique called garbage collection. The idea is that the programmer never invokes deallocate manually. Instead, the program is regularly paused and scanned for unused heap variables, which are then automatically deallocated. Thus, the above vulnerabilities can never occur. The drawbacks are the performance overhead of the regular scan and the probably long pause times. Rust takes a, a different approach to the problem. It uses a concept called ownership that is able to check the correctness of dynamic operations, dynamic memory operations at compile time. Thus, no garbage collection is needed to avoid the, men the mentioned vulnerabilities, which means that there is no performance overhead. Well, I mean, it just means that the performance overhead is spread out, right? Because we're still freeing memory. It's just we're freeing it when it needs to be freed instead of in chunks that cause a program to slow down or, or come to a halt. Another advantage of this approach is that the programmer still has fine-grained control over the use of dynamic memory, just like with C or C++. Right? If we never, if we never freed memory, that would be a performance win, right? Because we wouldn't have to worry about all of the extra work we need to do to free memory. Um, there are there some programs you can write in such a way that you've only, you only ever allocate and you never free. Um, because they're not long-running programs. Um, so you, you could avoid the whole performance overhead of freeing things, right, if you know that you're only allocating. But I think I'm, I'm getting too, too lost in the weeds there. Allocations in Rust. Instead of letting the programmer manually call allocate and deallocate, the Rust standard library provides abstraction types that call these functions implicitly. The most important type is box, which is an abri uh, abstraction for a heap allocated value. It provides a box new constructor function that, can, that takes a value, calls allocate with the size of the value, and then moves the value to the newly allocated slot on the heap. To free the memory he, the, sorry, to free the heap memory again, the box type implements the drop trait to call deallocate when it goes out of scope. 
So we have an open scope here. We allocate box here, and then Z goes out of scope and deallocate is called. This pattern has a strange name, resource acquisition is initialization, or Ray for short. Ray? Uh, it originated in C++, where it is used to implement a similar abstraction type called standard unique pointer. Okay? I don't know a lot about C++, unfortunately. Such a type alone does not suffice to prove prevent all use after free bugs since programmers can still hold on to references after the box goes out of scope and the corresponding heap memory slot is deallocated. This is where Rust's ownership comes in, ownership model comes in. It assigns an abstract lifetime to each reference, which is the scope in which the reference is valid. In the above example, the X reference is taken from the Z array because right, we're passing back the reference to the middle item here, to x. So it becomes invalid after z goes out of scope. When we run the above example on the playground, you see the Rust compiler indeed throws an error. z goes out of scope and deallocate is called. z is dropped while, st while still borrowed. Right. The terminology can be a bit confusing at first. Taking a reference to a value is called borrowing the value, since it's similar to a borrow in real life. You have temporary access to an object, but need to return it sometime, and you must not destroy it. By checking that all borrows end before an object is destroyed, the Rust compiler can guarantee that no use after free situation can occur. Rust's ownership system goes even further and does not only prevent use after free bugs, but provides complete memory safety like garbage collected languages like Java or Python do. Additionally, it guarantees thread safety and is thus even safer than those languages in multi-threaded code. And most importantly, all these checks happen at compile time, so there's no runtime overhead compared to handwritten memory management in C. Use cases. We now know the basics of dynamic memory allocation in Rust, but when, we, when should we use it? We've come really far with our kernel without dynamic memory allocation, so why do we need it now? First, dynamic memory allocation always comes with a bit of performance overhead since we need to find a free slot in the heap for every allocation. For this reason, local variables are generally preferable, especially in performance-sensitive kernel code. However, there are cases where dynamic memory allocation is the best choice. As a basic rule, dynamic memory is required for variables that have a dynamic lifetime or a variable size. The most important type of the dynamic lifetime is RC, which counts the references to its wrapped value and deallocates it after all references went out of scope. I would use the word go here because this is present tense, so it should be present tense here. Now I'm getting really nitpicky. Examples for type with a variable size are vec, string, and other collection types that dynamically grow when more elements are added. These types work by allocating a larger amount of memory when they become full, copying all elements over, and then deallocating the old allocation. For our kernel, we will mostly need the collection types, for example, for storing a list of active tasks when implementing multitasking in future posts. Not sure we get that far with the current version, but we'll see. The allocator interface. The first step in implementing a heap allocator is to add a dependency on the built-in alloc crate. Like the core crate, it is a subset of the standard library that additionally contains the allocation and allocation types. To add dependency on alloc, we add the following to our lib.rs. Oh, okay, we're writing code now. This is good. So lib extern create alloc. Um, I read somewhere you don't need to do extern create anymore. So I'm not sure what Contrary to normal dependencies, we don't need to modify the cargo.toml. The reason is that the alloc crate ships with the Rust compiler as part of the standard library, so the compiler already knows about the crate. By adding this extern crate statement, we specify that the compiler should try to include it. Historically, all dependencies needed an extern crate statement, which is now optional. Since we are compiling for a custom target, we can't use the pre-compiled version of alloc that is shipped with the Rust installation. Instead, we have to tell Cargo to recompile the crate from source. We can do that by adding it to unstable build standard array in our Cargo 
Hummel. Okay, so Alec here. Um, I'm just going to, for now, just leave out the extern crate and I want to see what happens without it. If I put Alec here like this, um, that should do the trick, right? Now the compiler will recompile, right? The reason that the alloc crate is disabled by default in no standard crates is that it has additional requirements. We can see these requirements as errors when we try to compile our project now. All right, so if I try to build it now, oh, it built it for Apple Darwin. Yeah, now it's building it for the right target. Okay, so it built it, but the fact that I didn't put extern crate in lib.rs, I think is probably why. So let's try it. Extern crate alloc. Yeah, okay. So that's it. No global memory allocator found, but one is required. Link to standard or at global allocator. Right. And then it says use feature default alloc error handler for a default error handler. Yeah. Okay. The first error occurs because the alloc crate requires a heap and heap allocator, which is an object that provides the allocate and deallocate functions. In Rust, heap allocators are described by the global alloc trait, which is mentioned in the error message. To set the heap allocator for crate, the global allocator attribute must be applied to a static variable that implements the global alloc trait. The second error occurs because calls to allocate can fail, most commonly when there is no more memory available. Our program must be able to react to this case, which is what the alloc error handler function is for. We will describe these traits and attributes in detail in the following sections. Okay, the global alloc trait. Okay, the global alloc trait defines the functions that heap allocator must provide. The trait is special because it's almost never used directly by the programmer. Instead, the compiler will automatically insert the appropriate calls to the trait methods when using the allocation and collection types of alloc. Since we will need to implement the trait for, our, for all our allocator types, it's worth taking a closer look at its declaration. So we have an alloc, we have a dealloc, we have alloc zeroed, we have a realloc. That's it, four, four things to implement. It defines two required methods, alloc and dealloc, which correspond to the allocate and deallocate functions we use in our examples. The alloc method takes a layout instance as an argument, which describes the desired size and alignment that the allocated memory should have, and returns a raw pointer to the first byte of the allocated memory block. Instead of an explicit error value, the alloc method returns a null pointer to signal an allocation error. So why did they use options here? I don't know. This is a bit non-idiomatic, but it has the advantage that wrapping existing system allocators is easy since they use the same convention. Yeah, but you can, okay. You can still wrap it and return an option. The dealloc method is the counterpart and responsible for freeing a memory block again. It receives two arguments. Let's look at it. There it is. The pointer returned by alloc and the layout that was used for the allocation. The trait additionally defines two methods, alloc zeroed and realloc, which with default implementations. Okay, that makes sense. You, for alloc zeroed, you just call alloc, right? And then zero it out and then return it. And in realloc, you just allocate new size, copy everything, right? And then dealloc the old one and then return the new one. Uh, the alloc zeroed method is equivalent to calling alloc and then setting the allocated memory block to zero, which is exactly what the provided default implementation does. An allocator implementation can override the default implementations with a more efficient custom implementation if possible. The realloc method allows to grow or shrink an allocation. It seems like there's a missing word there. The default Im implementation allocates a new memory block with the desired size and copies over all the content from the previous allocation. 
Again, an allocator implementation can probably provide a more efficient implementation of this method, for example, by growing, shrinking the allocation in place if possible. Unsafety. One thing to notice is that both the trait itself and all trait methods are declared unsafe. The reason for declaring the trait as unsafe is that the programmer must guarantee that the trait implementation for an allocator type is correct. For example, the alloc method must never return a memory block that is already used somewhere else because this would cause undefined behavior. Similarly, the reason that the methods are unsafe is that the caller must ensure various invariants when calling the methods. For example, that the layout passed to the alloc specifies a non-zero size. This is not really relevant in practice since the methods are normally called directly by the compiler, which ensures that the requirements are met. A dummy allocator. Now that we know what an allocator type should provide, we can create a simple dummy allocator. For that, we create a new allocator module. Okay, so in lib, we'll create pub mod allocator. And now it's going to say I can't find it. So we're going to make it. Okay, so the external crate is what's giving us access to this alloc thing here, right? Use core pointer null mute. And we have an empty struct, unsafe. So the whole implementation is unsafe. Self an unused layout. It's going to return a mute u8. And it's going to return a null pointer. Okay, and then the other thing we need to un implement is the dialloc with a pointer and a layout. And it's not going to do anything. I'm going to fix the English there just because. Okay. Um, the struct does not need any fields, so we create it as a zero size type. As mentioned above, we always return the null pointer from the alloc. So let's see, does this, will this build? We, oh, right, we didn't do the error handler yet. Um, we also didn't do this global allocator, so maybe that's something we need to also add here. Um, maybe above this thing? Let's find out. As mentioned above, we always return the null pointer from alloc, which corresponds to an allocation error. Since the allocator never returns any memory, a call to dealloc should never occur. For this reason, we simply panic in the dealloc method. The alloc zeroed and realloc methods have default implementations, so we don't need to provide implementations for them. We now have a simple allocator but we still have to tell the Rust compiler that it should use this allocator. This is where the global allocator attribute comes in. Global allocator attribute. Um, looks like we have to put it in a static here. The global allocator attribute tells the Rust compiler which allocator instance it should use as a global heap allocator. The attribute is only applicable to, to a static that implements the global alloc trait. Let's reg register an instance of our dummy allocator as the global allocator. Okay, oh, it's gotta be all upper, right? Since the dummy allocator is a zero by zero size type, we don't need to specify any fields in the initialization expression. When we now try to compile it, the first error should be gone. Let's fix the remaining second error, all right? Yes, the uh, error handler. Um, the alloc error handler attribute. As we learned when discussing the global alloc trait, the alloc function can signal an allocation error by returning a null pointer. The question is, how should the Rust runtime react to such an allocation failure? This is where the alloc error handler attribute comes in. It specifies a function that is called when an allocation error occurs, similar to how our panic handler is called when a panic occurs. Let's add such a function to fix, fix the compilation error. So in source lib, 
we have to add another fe the feature here. I guess I can just grab it. Come on. There we go. That took longer than just typing it in. Oh. Like that. And then... Oh, and this is still in lib. We're not putting it in... Um, hmm. Okay. In our allocator uh, function module. Layout is alloc, alloc, layout, bang, and then panic. Uh, whoa, my hands are shifted off the, uh, there. Allocation error, uh, layout. Just like that. Okay, so now we should have that, and yes, now we're clean. Okay, hopefully that, oh, just trying to shift things around here so I can get my hands on the keys properly. Okay. The alloc error handler function is still unstable, so we need a featured gate to enable it. The function receives a single argument, the layout instance that was passed to alloc when the allocation failure occurred. There's nothing we can do to resolve the failure, so we just panic with the message that contains the layout instance. With this function, the compilation errors should be fixed. And they are. We can see no errors, no warnings. Now we can use the allocation in collection types of alloc. For example, we can use a box to allocate a value on the heap. Except we, it's a dummy allocator, so it's not going to work, right? All right, well, let's try to go to main. All right, here's our main. Hello world, call integrate create mapper and frame allocator. That's there. So right, now we'll just create a new box, right? Let x equals box new one. Oh, 41, I have, okay. And that should fail, right? Because box new will call our allocator, and allocator will return a null pointer, and then boom. Use of undeclared type. Oh, we actually, ooh. Okay, so it's not, hmm. That's interesting. So I use alloc boxed box. I've never had to do that before. Here it says external create alloc, but that's part of lib already, right? So you still you have to add external create alloc to every place where you're going to use it. Interesting. Very interesting. All right. We have two warnings. That's because we're not using X. That's fine. We can actually use it here just to get the warning to go away. Because uh, it's never going to get that far, right? The box is going to fail. Um, note that we need to specify the extern create alloc statement in our main.rs too. This is required because lib.rs and main.rs part are treated as separate crates. However, we don't need to create another global allocator static because the global allocator applies to all crates in the project. In fact, specifying an additional allocator in another crate would be an error. When we run the above code, we see that our alloc error handler function is called. Okay, let's give it a shot. Cargo run. And ta-da! Panicked at allocation error layout size 4, line 4, source lib rs 103, colon 5. Okay. The error handler is called because the box new function implicitly calls the alloc function of the global allocator. Our dummy allocator always returns a null pointer, so every allocation fails. To fix this, we need to create an allocator that actually returns usable memory. All right, creating a kernel heap. Let's check this in. Git commit. Oh. 
right? Git add source allocator, git commit dash am. Uh, and we just re adding, adding a dummy allocator and testing the error handler. Before we can create a proper allocator, we first need to create a heap memory region from which the allocator can allocate memory. To do this, we need to define a virtual memory range for the heap region and then map this region to physical frames. See the introduction to paging post for an overview of the virtual memory and page tables. Um, yeah, and that's a previous video. The first step is to define a virtual memory region for the heap. We can choose any virtual address range we like as long as it's not already used for a different memory region. Let's define it as the memory starting at address, whatever, 444444, so that we can easily recognize a heap pointer later. Okay, so we can have a pub const heap start. It's gonna be u size. And then pub const heap end. Hundred K. Uh, we set the heap size to hundred K for now. If we need more space in the future, we can simply increase it. If we tried to use this heap region now, a page fault would occur since the virtual memory region is not mapped to a phys to physical memory yet. To resolve this, we create an init heap function that maps the heap pages using the mapper API that we introduced in the paging implementation post. Yeah, and I have the video for that too. Um, okay, so we're still in allocator and we're gonna put a couple of uses here for the x86-64 crate. Structures, paging, mapper, map to error size right so we have those and then we have the vert header uh, let's reformat that okay and then we have our init heap and a frame allocator. Uh, returns a result of unit or map to error size for KIB. It's probably a way to simplify that, right? Uh, let page range equals Heap start is vert adder new heap start as u64. So why'd we make it a u size then? That's why I was hesitating for a second. Why set it to u size if we could have just set it to u64 and avoided the as? Let heap end is a heap start plus heap size minus one. still unknown. That's a vert adder. Does this not compile? Oh, heap. Oh, heap size. Oh, did I get that? Oh, heap. I called it heap end. That's why. Okay, so now heap end should have a value, right? It's a vert adder. Okay. All right, and then let heap start rain start page is page containing address heap start heap end page heap 
heap end. And then we have page range inclusive heap start page heap end page. Wow, okay, that's interesting. So it's creating this page range. And then we're going to go for page in page range. Frame is equal to the frame allocator. Allocate frame. OK, or map to error. Frame allocation failed. Right? Let flags is page. Table flags present. And page table flags right a bowl. I, I assume oops. I assume that by putting both flags there, they both have to be valid on the page we find, mapper. Map to page frame flags frame allocator flush. And then we can just say OK down here. Um, and we can't do this. Um, we have mapper here. Unself, that's why. There we go. Heap end page. Oh, because I, okay, I can fix that. Here we go. This function takes mutable references to a mapper and a frame allocator instance. And here's the mapper and the frame allocator instance, both limited to 4K pages by using size 4K IB as a generic parameter. The return value of the function is a result with the unit type as success variant and map to error as error variant, which is the error type returned by the mapper to the mapper map to method. Okay. Right. So the right, so the mapper map to is the error creates the error map to error. And we actually have a um, an okay or here, which will do it also. Reusing the error type makes sense here because the map to method is the main source of errors in this function. The implementation can be broken down into two parts, creating the page range. To create a range of the pages that we want to map, we convert the heap start pointer to a vert adder type. Then we calculate the heap end address from it by adding the heap size. We want an inclusive bound at the address of the last byte of the heap, so we subtract one. Next, we convert the addresses into page types using the containing address function. Finally, we create a page range from the start and end pages using the page range inclusive function. Um, the second part is mapping the pages. The second step is to map all the, all pages of the map page range we just created. For that, we iterate over the pages in that range using a for loop. For each page, we do the following. We allocate a physical frame from that page, physical frame that the page should be mapped to using the frame allocator allocate frame. This method returns none when there are no more frames left. We deal with that case by mapping it to a map to error frame allocation failed error through the option OK or method, and then apply the question mark operator. Right? That's there. Um, we deal with that case by mapping it to, oh, sorry. Um, we apply the question mark operator to return early in case of an error. We set the required present flag and the writable flag for the page. With these flags, both read and write accesses are allowed, which makes sense for heap memory. We use the mapper map to method for creating the mapping in the active page table. The method can fail. That's why we have the question mark here. Therefore, we use the question mark operator again to forward the error to the caller. On success, the method returns a mapper flush instance that we can use to update the translation look aside buffer using the flush method. The final step is to call this function from our kernel main.
So we're going to have blog OS allocator. And we're going to need from memory, uh, memory itself, and the boot info frame allocator. So here's the hello world. I condensed this because Clippy was, was upset with it. Here's the FizzMem stuff, the mapper. Oh, now we can actually set these, right? To something real. Oh, I see. That's why we did that. Um, because we want to take this out of here, I guess. Um, and then here's the new code. We're going to say allocator in a heap. And we're going to pass in the mapper and the frame allocator. And that returns um, that, that this, the expect will consume the result, the error result. Okay, so does this build? It does. Okay, so that allows us to go on a single line. That's nice. Okay. Um, so now we should be able to run it, right? We show the full function for context here. The only new lines are the blog OS allocator import and the call to allocator in a heap function. In case the init heap function returns an error, we panic using the result expect method since there is currently no sensible way for us to handle this error. Yeah, if you can't allocate your heap, you don't have a operating system. So we now have a mapped heap memory region that is ready to be used. The box new call still uses our old dummy allocator. So you will still see the out of memory error when you run it. But if we see the out of memory error when we run it, that means the allocator init heap worked. So let's just check that. Okay. So we got the allocator error, allocation error, which is what we were hoping to see and not the initialization failed error. So that means the initialization worked. So let's um, added heap Okay. Using an allocator crate. Since implementing an allocator is somewhat complex, we start by using an external allocator crate. We will learn how to implement our own allocator in the next post. A simple allocator crate for no standard applications is the linked list allocator crate. Its name comes from the fact that it uses a linked list data structure to keep track of deallocated memory regions. See the next post for more detailed explanation of this approach. Okay. So we're going to just get things working, I guess, by doing this. So in our cargo toml, we're going to add a linked list allocator. And I'll use the version that they have there rather than the latest. Oh, I guess I could use the cargo add. I should start remembering to use that. Then we can replace our dummy allocator with the allocator provided by that crate. Okay, so we still need that. We still need that. So we can just say use linked list allocator locked heap. And now instead of dummy equals dummy, we say locked heap is equal locked heap empty. The struct is named locked heap because it uses the spinning top spin lock type for synchronization. This is required because multiple threads could access the allocator static at the same time. As always, when using a spin lock or a mutex, we need to be careful to not accidentally cause a deadlock. This means we shouldn't perform any allocations in interrupt handlers since they can run in arbitrary time and might interrupt an in progress allocation. Setting the locked heap as a global allocator is not enough. The reason is that we use the empty constructor function, which creates an allocator without any backing memory. Like our dummy allocator, it always returns an error on alloc. To fix this, we need to initialize the allocator after creating the heap. Okay, so we're going to change our init heap code. To add unsafe allocator lock init heap start heap size. Okay, wow, nice. 
We use, we use the lock method on the inner spin lock of the locked heap type to get an exclusive reference to the heap instance, on which we then call the init method with the heap bounds as arguments. So all it knows, all the allocator knows is the heap start and heap size address, uh, heap start address and the heap size. Okay. It's important that we initialize the heap after mapping, after mapping the heap pages, since the init function already tries to write to the heap memory. So it must be setting some, I wonder if we can take a look at that. What does it do? It creates a whole list. I don't see it writing to the region, but it seems like it's, I mean, it seems like it's reasonable to have everything ready to go before you initialize your allocator, right? Um, after initializing the heap, we can now use all allocation and collection types of the built-in alloc create without error. Oh, okay, so we're gonna add a few little doohickeys here to, to show that we're actually working. So we can just say println heap value at, oh, this is a heap value now. So we can take a look at what the address of that heap value is by saying uh, print it as a pointer instead of as a value. Um, we're going to say let not vec is vec new for i in zero 500 vec push i and then println vec at um, oh, we have to do it this way now. Vec as slice. Okay, now we're going to do RCs. Okay, oh, that means we have to go up here and add the extra types here. Vec, vec, oh, you have to import these too. Okay. So vec doesn't come in for free and um, RC does, well, RC already doesn't. But box does, right? And then vec normally does. Uh, it's part of the Rust prelude, but we we skip the prelude um, by saying no standard. Let reference counted rc new vec bang one two three. Let cloned reference reference counted clone. Print line. RC strong count cloned reference core mem drop reference counted and now we just print it again. Reference count is this now. And then we still have it did not crash and we get rid of the X since I got rid of it from up above. Okay. And it blew up because I forgot the bang here and here. Strong C-O-U-N-T. C-O-U-N-T. Okay. Good. This code example shows some uses of the box, vec, and RC types. For the box and vec types, we print the underlying heap pointers using the colon p formatting specifier. For showcasing RC, we create a reference counted heap value and use the RC strong count function to print the current reference count before and after dropping an instance. When we run it, we see the following. Let's see what we see, and then we can compare. Scope guard. Okay, so we see heap value at, yeah, this was the address we set up. Then vec shows up at 800, it's, sorry, 0800 hex. And the current reference count is two. We did a drop, reference count is one now, and it did not crash. Okay, so that's working. We're actually able to allocate memory uh, using a crate to do the allocation, but we're, we've supplied the uh, frame allocator. Neat. As expected, we see that the box and vec values live on the heap as indicated by the pointer starting with the 
444444 prefix. The reference counted value also behaves as expected, with a reference count being two after the clone call and one again after one of the instances was dropped. The reason the vector starts at offset 800 is not that the box value is 800 bytes large, but the reallocations that occur when a vector needs to increase its capacity. For example, when the vector's capacity is 32 and we try to add the next element, the vector allocates a new backing array with capacity 64 behind the scenes and copies all elements over. Then it frees the old allocation. Of course, there are many more allocation collection types in the alloc crate that we can now use in our kernel. Um, I want to see this, and I think we can do that, right? We can say let mut vec equals vec new, let mute uh, pointer is equal to vec as slice. Oh. And then we can just print it every time it changes, right? Printlin vec is at pointer p. Oh, is there a way to get the address? Let me look that up. Rust show address of slice. Slice as star const t as star const t. Or we could just say as t as pointer. Can I do that? It gave me two warnings. Oh, because it's not me. Okay, so let's see if this, this works. I just want to see it, it change as it changes, right? And then we can just say if vec as pointer. Oh, no, we have to use the pointer equal, right? Standard pointer equal. Let new pointer is equal to vec as pointer. If not standard pointer eq pointer new pointer then we're going to say pointer is equal to new pointer and then print lin back moved to pointer p okay let's see if that works it does not oh Oh, because no standard. Uh, can we just compare the pointers directly? We can. What type is it? Okay. All right, let's run this. Vic is at four. Huh, okay, so it didn't, so it didn't work. I guess doing it as pointer doesn't work. Maybe I have to do as slice as pointer? I'll try that. No, same thing, okay. So I was, I was hoping this would show us the VEC as it moved through memory. I mean, this is clearly printing out the value of the pointer. This is never showing up. And this is for some reason four. All right, well, I guess we get rid of all that. I'll have to look up how to do that because that would be interesting to see as it moved. Okay, um, but we can commit these changes. Git status, git add dash am using the linked list allocator to test out our frame allocator. I guess it's a heap allocator. There. 
All right. There are many more allocation and collections types in the alloc crate that we can now use in our kernel, including the thread safe reference counted pointer arc, the owned string type string on the format macro, linked list, growing or grubble ring buffer vec dq or vec deck. I like the vec deck pronunciation better. Binary heap, priority queue, the B tree map, and B tree set. Um, what about hash map and hash set too? Hopefully those, those would work. These types will become very useful when we want to implement thread lists, scheduling queues, or support for async await. Adding a test. To ensure that we don't accidentally break our new allocation code, we should add an integration test for it. We'll start by creating a new tests heap allocation RS file with the following content. Now I do have, I did create a test skeleton. So let's copy tests, test skeleton to tests heap allocation. Oh, okay, so we're going to need a little more. We're going to need um, Huh, so why Why wasn't that part of my skeleton? Because it seems like this would all be part of the skeleton feature. Custom test frameworks Test runner blog OS Test runner. Re-export test harness main is equal to test main. Um, before I go any further, this stack overflow was the last one we added. Does that have those? See, it doesn't have those. Oh, because it yeah, it's a special. Okay. All right, and then we have extern create alloc. Um, before I do that, there's core panic panic info entry point main. Let's do that. We're going to make this part of our test harness entry point bang main, and then this becomes main with a boot info static boot info there's the unimplemented and there's a panic or a test handler so that we do need this bootloader stuff use bootloader entry point boot info okay so this is this is a a good test uh, uh, skeleton Okay, and then we still have this one. Oh, tests heap there. Okay. Oh, the no mangle doesn't belong there anymore, and the extern C doesn't belong there anymore. Okay, I'll have to fix that as well. Let's do that real quick. There. Okay. Tests heap. Okay. We reuse the test runner and test panic handler functions from our lib.rs. Since we want to test allocations, we enable the alloc create to the extern create alloc statement. Okay, yeah, so this is where we have to do this. All right. For more information about the test boilerplate test, check out the testing post. The implementation of the main function looks like this. Use blog OS allocator. Use blog OS memory. Self and boot info frame allocator. Use x86 64 vert adder. Okay, we have to do the init. We have to grab the fizzmem offset. Right, so these three lines, oops, I misspelled init. 
right? Those are exactly the same lines. That would be nice to um, factor out, right? Those are init heap. And then we call test main. And then we loop. It's very similar to the kernel main function in our main.rs with the differences that we don't invoke println, don't include any example allocations, and call test main unconditionally. Now we're re ready to add a few test cases. First, we add a test that performs some simple allocations using a box and checks the allocated values to ensure that basic allocations work. All right, so now we're going to add tests here. Okay, so test case. Simple allocation. Heap value one is box new, 41. Heap value two is box new, 13. Assert EQ. Heap value one is 41. And heap value two is 13. Okay, if I say cargo test, oh, I guess I don't have one here. Um, I should be able to say cargo test heap allocation, right? Nope. Oh, I have to add alloc box box, okay. A semicolon after. Who knew? It failed. Heap allocation drive with bus is equal zero, uni equals zero, index equals zero exists. Huh. Okay, that's a shame. I wonder if we're going to get to that because we were able to run the other tests, right? I say cargo test stack overflow. Oh no, test failed. Oh, to rerun past lib? No, there was, there was some other thing I had to do, test. Yeah, okay. Okay, oops, so we should be able to put test. I don't know why I have to say dash dash test. That's something different. Okay, so now it works. It was saying rerun to rerun past dash dash lib. Not sure why. But if you pass dash dash test, then it works. Okay, we got simple allocation working. Um, Next, we iteratively build a large vector to test both large allocations and multiple allocations due to reallocations. Okay, let's add a test case for that. Assert EQ. Vec iter sum u64 is equal to n minus 1 times n divided by 2. Yep, that's how you calculate the sum of... Oh, Crouch, thank you for the follow. Much appreciated. I hope you're enjoying the series. Or at least this for video, if not the entire series. Okay, heap allocation, so we should be able to run that with a large vec test. And of course, I forgot to add up here, alloc vec vec. Crouch says, thank you for doing such a big project live. I wish it were bigger, actually. Um, 
I, I am enjoying it. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's this, I don't know who Philip Opperman is, but I'm a huge shout out to him for, for having done this whole thing. Um, and it's just, you know, we get heap allocation, which is what we're on now. We're going to look at a bunch of different allocators designs, I guess. Um, I, I didn't really read ahead, but they did mention that we were going to do a linked list allocator. And then we're going to talk about async await. Um, it ends there, unfortunately. It would be nice if it went a little bit further, right, and talked about user level versus, you know, creating the, the system call interface. That would be a lot of um, fun to try to implement or to learn how to implement. So I, th there's, there's more work, work that can be done, right, to get the, a basic operating system working. All right, so large vec works. We verify the sum by comparing it with the formula for the nth partial sum. This gives us some confidence that the allocated values are all correct. As a third test, we create 10,000 allocations after each other, one after each other. Okay. Test case, um, many boxes, or i in zero to heap size. Wow, okay, that's a lot. Let x equals box new of i. Assert eq x is equal to i. Okay. This assert is, is the same assert as up here, but that's okay. I think we just want to use the x that was allocated. Otherwise, um, it would be thrown away. So this is basically just allocating and freeing heap size time, which is 100. It's i32. It doesn't tell me the value. That would be nice because it's a constant, right? It's just heap size is, oh, it's not in this file. Um, but we'll have to pull it in, right? So we need to add it to our blog OS. Cater, heap. Somehow it knew, knew oh, it, it, but it got it wrong. Okay, so now, yeah, there it is. Okay, it does show you the size, 100K. Okay, um, and then is there anything else we need to pull in? Does that just build? That does, that does just build, okay. Takes a while to run, but it, it works. This test ensures that the allocator reuses freed memory for subsequent allocations since it would run out of memory otherwise. This might seem like an obvious requirement for an allocator, but there are allocator designs that don't do this. An example is the bump allocator design that will be explained in the next post. Let's run our new integration tests. Okay, we did. All three tests succeeded. You can also invoke cargo tests without test argument to run all unit and integration tests. Let's, let's watch them all work. Pretty exciting. Look at that. Summary. This post gave an introduction to dynamic memory and explained why and where it's needed. We saw how Rust's borrow checker prevents the common vulnerabilities and learned how Rust's allocation API works. After creating a minimal implementation of Rust's allocator interface using the dummy allocator, we created a proper heap memory region for our kernel. For that, we defined a virtual address range for the heap and then mapped all pages of that range to physical frames using the mapper and frame allocator from the previous post. Finally, we added a dependency on a list at the linked list allocator crate to add proper allocator to our kernel. With this allocator, we were able to use box, vec, and other allocation and collection types from the alloc crate. What's next? While we already added heap allocation support in this post, we left most of the work to the linked list allocator crate. The next post will show in detail how an allocator can be implemented from scratch. It will present multiple possible allocator designs shows how to implement simple versions of them and explain their advantages and drawbacks. Okay. Um, and I just want to hit uh, Philip Opperman's Patreon uh, to help help get him to, um, to continue supporting this. It would be nice. Okay. That is that. That is my stream for today.